Good morning. My name is Michael Hutchinson, and I'm here to speak to you about truth and reconciliation and improving the relationship between Canadians and First Nations. I have been the host of APTN National News. I have also been a host of CTV Morning Live here in Winnipeg, and I am the author of the Mighty Muskrat Mystery Series, which is about four young cousins on the Windy Lake First Nation and their adventures uh, solving mysteries on their First Nation and sometimes in the city. Um, I'm here to talk to you about reconciliation and reconciliation for me has a lot to do with treaty. This is a example of a treaty uh, medal that I was given back when I worked for the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. This is a replica of the treaty medals that were given to First Nation chiefs when treaties were made uh, during the number treaty making. Um, I'm a part of Treaty 5 which is sort of in northern uh, Manitoba, the interlake region of Manitoba. My reserve is Misipawistic, which uh, sort of sits at the intersection of uh, the North Saskatchewan River and the Churchill River waterways. Uh, so it was a very important community during the fur trade. And you can see here, there's a there's a Canadian gentleman here uh, shaking hands with a First Nation gentleman. The hatchet is buried, the sun is shining, the rivers are flowing, the grass is growing. And that's all about treaty. Um, there was no war fought with my people, the Swampy Cree people of Treaty 5. Uh, Canadians agreed to share this land and this treaty medal represents a peace and friendship treaty that was made between trading partners, not warring partners, trading partners. And we agreed to share the land um, and that is a very important aspect of treaty. Now, um, I asked a First Nation elder once, you know, we're all supposed to make a better life for our children. That's what Europeans were doing when they came over to these lands. So, so where did they go wrong in the, the proper uh, expression of um, neighborliness with First Nations? And what my elders told me was where uh, Europeans and Canadians went wrong was everybody is supposed to make a better life for their children. But in doing that, you must respect the nations and the cultures around you and their right to raise their children in their own way. And this is where uh, Canadians and the Crown and Europeans went wrong when it came to colonialism in Canada. What colonialism really does is say, you are now going to change and adapt in our way and we're not gonna let you do it in your way anymore. So really what reconciliation is about is returning to a proper balance when it comes to land, law, and the economy of First Nations and, and properly sharing in these lands. Um, so let's start with law. You know, the invasion of uh, Canada, the Canadian lands and First Nation territories resulted in the erosion of First Nation law and Canadians have very, have, have worked to erode First Nation laws and First Nation groups as groups and try to turn us into a bunch of individuals. Um, when it comes to law, you know, if you look at the uh, residential school system, uh, my uh, characters take go visit the Truth and Reconcil the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation in Winnipeg during the second book, The Case of the Missing Auntie. Now, residential schools were not only about uh, were in a big way about law, in that, you know, uh, a lot of my friends ask me why did First Nations sort of except the Indian Act and all its racist rules and its, its undemocratic rules. Why did First Nations accept that? Well, in a very real sense, Canadians at the time had our children. They had our children in residential schools. And one of the things about residential schools that isn't talked a lot about is the impact of those schools on the parents and how they were used as leverage for the Indian agents to control First Nation parents. Imagine if you were told, you know, if you want to see your children this Christmas, you have to stay here. You can't leave the reserve. Imagine if you were told, if you want to, your children to come back home, you have to do what I tell you. Um, you know, and, and, and that is in a very real way how residential schools were used to control First Nations and their law. So, um, you know, in continuing colonial law, and colonialism and its effect on law. In Hong Kong, when it was under British rule, there was a saying in Hong Kong that said, we are force fed the fruits of a democracy, but we are not allowed to tend our own tree. And this 
uh, statement describes colonialism in a nutshell, and it also describes the colonial effects of the Indian Act system. You know, the Indian Act system is Canadian law that is imposed on First Nations. Now, if we look at the Indian Act system, it is a standalone governance system. If you look at Canadian governance, you know, when a First Nation has a pro or when a Canadian person has a, a problem, they can go to their elected mayor, they can go to their elected MLA, and they can go to their elected member of parliament at the federal level. And all these three have different jurisdictions, but they overlap so that Canadian problems are taken care of. And through the election system, if these people aren't doing their job, they're removed. Now, let's look at the Indian Act system. Under the Indian Act system, a First Nation person can vote for their mayor or chief uh, at the community level, but at the provincial level, they have a Indian Act hireling who doesn't have to listen to them to keep their job. At the top, we have an appointed minister who, again, does not have to listen to the people they govern in order to keep their job. So while there is democracy at three levels of the Canadian system, there is really only democracy at the bottom level of the First Nation system. And this is one of the reasons why the Indian Act system doesn't change. And it's one of the reasons why Canadians have so much control in First Nation communities. And, um, you know, if Canadians had democracy at all levels of their system, do you think we'd have uh, effective water systems on all our First Nations? I believe we would. So that is one way in which the Indian Act is still keeping First Nations back by removing our access to proper econ uh, a proper democracy. Now, <clears throat> another aspect that I mentioned is lands and economy. Now, if you add up all the First Nation reserve lands in Canada, it's slightly bigger than the size of Vancouver Island. Okay, let me say that again. If you add up all the reserve land in Canada, it is slightly more than the size of Vancouver Island. Now look at the size of Canada, and then look at the size of Vancouver Island. It's quite a bit smaller. <laughs> and so municipalities in Canada, they create their self-sufficiency by charging people access to their land. Right? by charging people access to their land and the resources on those lands and in those lands. And so that's how municipalities make their self-sufficiency. Without a proper land base, First Nations will never be self-sufficient. And this is why it's so important to, uh, to resolve land claims and that sort of stuff, because it, it speaks directly to First Nations' ability to be self-sufficient within their communities. And without self-sufficiency, again, First Nations are under Canadian control. Um, so First Nations be, need to be more sufficient uh, in order to have true democracy and the ability to adapt in the way they want to adapt. Now, um, you know, part of the truth and reconciliation is the truth aspect. And so what does that mean? Well, there is a lot of propaganda in Canada. For example, you know, um, let's say, the non-taxation of First Nation people when they live and work on their land. Well, what's that about? Well, um, it's a system of control. First Nation or Canadians pay for local culture and local goals through local taxation. So Canadians at the time of the creation of the India Act didn't want First Nation communities to reflect First Nation cultures, First Nation languages. They wanted them to reflect Canadian cultures and Canadian languages. And so Canadians removed the ability of these communities to raise funds in order to support First Nation languages and culture. And that is why First Nations are tax-free when they live and work in their communities because that taxation would go to support First Nation goals and Canadians at the time of the creation of the Indian Act didn't want that. So that is one reason why uh, truth is important and getting to the truth of all these things. Canadians contribute to today's Canada. There's a stat that says something like you know, 75% of Canadians live within 200 kilometers of the American border in cities. Well, that stat's pretty much reversed for Indigenous people. We live outside that 200 kilometer border, many of us, and we live in rural areas. And so in a very real way, First Nations and Indigenous people, the Inuit, hold on to lands that Canadians want to control, but do not want to live on. 
So through treaties and agreements that made, like the the, uh, the territory of Nunavut, um, Canadians get to legally control land that they don't want to live on, and. That is one of the things that Indigenous communities are doing for Canadians today, is holding on to that land that Canadians don't want to live on. Um, our communities, that's where our communities are, are and that's what those legal uh, arrangements do for Canadians. So, in a short, uh, truth and reconciliation is going to take a lot of work. It's going to take some reconciliation on the law and the uh, economic aspects and it's going to take some truth to overcome the many years of Canadian propaganda that affect the current Canadian and First Nation relationship. Again, my name is Michael Hutchinson and I've been given the opportunity to speak to you about truth and reconciliation. I really hope that uh, the Canadian First Nation uh, relationship improves and that's one of the reasons I wrote my books. There's a lot of lessons in there about First Nation thinking about the Canadian First Nation relationship. Again, I said I'm a big fan of treaty. And I hope that you take a look at your treaties in your area and understand how the First Nations in your area contribute to your people. Thank you again and have a great Truth and Reconciliation Day.